I will never forget that autumn day in Budapest, when I was 23 years old and we all sat under a walnut tree in the garden of one of those wonderful restaurants, chatting confidentially and privately around a big table. My brother Ernst and I had traveled from Vienna with our father for the fifth Congress of the International Psychoanalytic Association. For the moment, the grimness of the last few contentious months of 1918 gave way to our mood of celebration. Budapest's mayor, Istvan Bachi, the city magistrates, high-level military and medical officials from Hungary, Austria and Germany welcomed almost 50 of us with receptions and private banquets. Shandor Ferenczi and Melanie Klein were there, and so was the young Istvan Holos and Geza Roheim, the future anthropologist. Our conversations continued on a Danube steamer, which carried us between our lodgings at the Gelenfurdo Hotel and the meetings at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. We compared notes on war neurosis or shell shock, and the papers by Ernst Zimmel, Ferenczi, Karl Abraham, and Max Eitingon, my father's colleagues who had used psychoanalysis to treat traumatized soldiers with great results. On September 28th, Siegfried Bernfeld and I rode back to the Academy of Science to hear my father speak about the future of psychoanalysis. We were simply not prepared for the force and eloquence of that speech. Freud had titled it, Lines of Advance in Psychotherapy, and what he offered was a wholesale commitment to progressive values. But first he warned us that psychoanalysis as a science was in danger, at risk of elitist isolation and medical arrogance. Then, he set his sights on the coming years. The conscience of society will awake, he said, and remind it that the poorest man should have just as much right to assistance for his mind as he now has to life-saving help offered by surgery. And that the neuroses menace the health of a people no less than tuberculosis and can be left as little as the latter to the feeble handling of individuals. It may be a long time before the state comes to see these duties as urgent, he said. Probably these institutions will be started by private charity, sometime or other. However, it must come to this. Ferenczi began planning, but it was Max who opened our first free psychoanalytic clinic one year later in Berlin. Meanwhile, I had just gained my certification as a school teacher in Vienna and was in analysis with my father, training to become a psychoanalyst myself. The Budapest speech had set social justice as the goal for all of us, in our practices, at the clinics, in the schools, Education is aimed for control and even suppression of the instincts. But at what cost? What if, instead, education aimed to make the individual a useful and civilized member of society? Psychoanalysis could serve as a guide for educators. It could and it would wake the conscience of society. I called on some like-minded colleagues in Vienna to get the project started. My friend, August Eichhorn, and I met every Friday afternoon and we toured the social welfare agencies which were thriving under our new social democratic government. Eichhorn was a teacher and a psychoanalyst like myself. We visited Siegfried Bernfeld, who also in 1919 founded Kinderheim Baumgarten an educational refuge for Jewish child refugees in Vienna. We also visited a former refugee camp in Oberhollerbrunn in Lower Austria. 
which Eichhorn had already transformed into a pioneering state residence and school for troubled adolescents. I was captivated by his work. Eichhorn wasn't only able to reach children otherwise unreachable, he influenced a lot of us. The more Eichhorn and his staff thought about the educational and psychological needs of stigmatized children, the more he pushed for environmental change. Without it, as Bernfeld said, education simply prolongs the status quo and stifles human growth. I joined the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society in 1922 and along with Eichhorn made the case that the flexibility and innovation of psychoanalysis could be used productively in education. The ideas of Maria Montessori, socialism and psychoanalysis and even Willem Reich's more radical proposals were popular then and both Bernfeld and Eichhorn knew how to merge them into the kind of empowering approach to education that would promote systemic change. As my own ideas about education developed, I began to think of the classroom as a modernist place where the child could become a free and self-reliant human being. A conservative teacher of the old school would say, the rebellious spirit of this boy must be broken before it is too late and he has become a serious menace to society. A modern educator, on the contrary, would have the highest hopes for the child's future and would expect to see in him a future leader and liberator of the masses. We can discover in each child a perfectly definite constellation of hopes and fears, dislikes and preferences, jealousy and tenderness, the need for love and the rejection of it. Children not only need to be taught, but need a chance to teach themselves. At the same time, we impose limitations on their thinking and we place obstacles in the way of their creative activities. Worse, traditional educators always want to make the child into what suits them, deferring by the century, position, rank and class of the adults. Yet, education appears to us in another light, when we have another aim in view. Disabled children and those affected by war, refugee children, children from poor families, or, as Alfred Adler would agree, those who are simply unloved or misunderstood, call on us to figure out their particular developmental and social needs. Despite all the ordeals and obstacles we faced after the war, our new ideas were welcomed in Vienna in the mid-1920s. Progressive newspapers cheered when Eduard Hitchmann opened the Ambulatorium, our free outpatient clinic for people of all social classes and occupations. Our wonderful Minister of Education, Otto Glöckel, based his democratic school reforms on a simple idea, education for independence. Within our psychoanalytic society, Josef Friedjung, a pediatrician and city council member, convinced us that both parents and the schools must be involved in preventing childhood neurosis from deteriorating into later adult psychopathology. Friedjung's ideas reminded me of Ferenczi, who advocated for cooperation between educators and pediatricians and psychoanalysts. Analytic education can count amongst its success greater openness between parents and children. And for myself, the positive results of child analysis inspired me to make plans for the first of our modernist, psychoanalytically informed school projects. We called it the Hitzing School. My companion, Dorothy Tiffany Burlingham, had the money to build the school, pay the teachers, buy the supplies, and keep the project going for the five years. 
from 1927 through 1932. It was a sweet two-level log cabin with enough room for a library and lots of trees in the backyard of Eva Rosenfeld's house in Hitzing. But Dorothy brought in far more than mere wealth. For me, personally, we could share what it meant to be the youngest daughter of a great man. Her father was the American artist, Louis Comfort Tiffany. The progressive worldview she carried from New York matched my modern Viennese outlook. I have spent most of my life trying to understand children, and so had Dorothy. We came up with a pedagogy all our own. To my vision of a school organized according to psychoanalytic principles, we added Montessori's creativity, John Dewey's independent thinking, August Eichhorn's depth of empathy, Siegfried Bernfeld's demand for freedom from repression, and Ferenczi's rejection of what he called traditional cult of authorities. Our search for teachers brought us Erik Eriksson and Peter Bloss, two modern-minded young men in their 20s, not yet settled in a career and willing to join an exciting venture of this kind. Bloss later devised our field's theory of adolescent development, while Eriksson became famous for his lifespan model of human identity. Ernst Chris took us to the museums in Vienna, but Erik Eriksson was an artist. At Hitzing, Eriksson said, I began to perceive how important visual configurations were, how they actually preceded words and formulations. Dreams are visual data, and so is children's play. So many teachers judge themselves by what they get children to learn. But teaching is not only presentation of facts. It is persuading students to be interested in the world, a state of mind, and they were. Hitzing's values opened my eyes to a wider world, one pupil said. It shows us different ways of thinking. It taught us tolerance and understanding. We met so many different kinds of people. It taught us to see large. Another student said that the school's liberal and creative atmosphere stayed with him all his life. I believe that my own values of anti-racism, individualism, and the absolute need for freedom while rejecting the cult of personality stemmed from the school. Back in Vienna then, we were all so excited, full of energy. It was as if a whole new continent was being explored. We were the explorers, and we now had the chance to change things. Our new psychoanalytic pedagogy came on the scene in a revolutionary spirit. We led seminars, organized the Vienna course for educators, and launched the Zeitschrift für Psychoanalytische Pädagogik, the Journal of Psychoanalytic Pedagogy. We started our toddler research at the Jackson Nursery in a space we shared with Maria Montessori's Haus des Kindes on Rudolfsplatz. Of course, we also knew that the right-wing and increasingly militarized parties were gaining power in Vienna. It's enclosed, like many of the city's interwar reformist institutions. But until the end of our lives, even in exile, in all our work with children, Dorothy and I stayed true to Freud's bracing, memorable lines on the conscience of society.